Hello, I'm Ralph Ferrand, and may I welcome you to another tutorial from Biker's Toolbox. This is an introduction to motorcycle wiring. Whilst it is not in the remit of most home fettlers, nor many independent workshops for that matter, to tackle the horrifically complex wiring found on many modern motorcycles employing CAN bus systems controlled by computers, most home mechanics should be able to cope with what used to be ordinary automotive wiring before the digital revolution. The purpose of this series of tutorials is to demonstrate good wiring practices on more analogue motorcycles and will be particularly useful to those restoring bikes from what I consider the glory days of motorcycles the 70s and 80s, when bikes were raw and exciting, but could be fixed by people at home with a decent toolkit, some mechanical aptitude and a willingness to learn. Many bikers I have talked to see motorcycle electrical systems as complicated and beyond the average person's comprehension. Whereas, the reality is that bike wiring is pretty much just a collection of very simple circuits. The worst scenario I come across, and unfortunately only too often, is the aftermath of those who understand the simplicity of, say, an indicator circuit, but have no understanding of good workshop practice in automotive wiring. If you are going to work on the bike's electrical system, it is of paramount importance that you learn good practice and don't cut corners. Hopefully in these tutorials I will show you that if you break it down, motorcycle wiring is fairly simple and easy to understand. My pet hate are pre-insulated terminals, which are seemingly sold in every auto shop in the land and are simply not fit for purpose. If they were acceptable components, the motorcycle manufacturers would use them, but in reality, they never do. They are simply a DIY bodge, and quite why they are so prevalent in the marketplace is a mystery to me, but we do not sell them at Biker's Toolbox. Using proper professional terminals is not massively more expensive, if at all, than bodge terminals, and decent crimp tools aren't going to break the bank either. When wiring is done badly, it can end in disaster and can even lead to fire and being sat aside a burning bike is never going to improve a rider's day. I have found many beautiful classic motorcycles with some abominable crimes inflicted upon their wiring. How anyone could possibly think that twisting wires together and wrapping the ensuing mess in PVC insulating tape is in any way safe or acceptable is completely beyond me. Another commonplace crime against reliable electrics is less commonly understood as being bad, and that is soldering. There are situations on a motorcycle where, as a result of the original design, there is no option but to solder the joints. For example, the handlebar switches, and often the side stand switches. Motorcycle wiring uses multi-conductor flexible wire due to vibration from the engine and the undulations in the road, the wiring is effectively constantly moving. When a solder joint is formed, 
the solder is melted to form the joint and the hot liquid solder is drawn into the strands of the cable by capillary action, effectively changing the cable into a single conductor wire, which is not flexible and will be vulnerable to stress fracturing from the vibration making it unreliable. Less than ideal. Old British motorcycles often had plenty of solder joints, and as a result, many riders were left without lights and often for momentum. They used to say, Lights by Lucas, the Prince of Darkness. During these tutorials, I will demonstrate how wire is joined properly, preserving the flexible properties of the wire. As with any job on a bike, if you are unwilling to buy the proper tools to do the job, then you should entrust the work to a respected professional. Wire sizing causes us a bit of a headache at Biker's Toolbox because so few people seem to understand the way in which wire is measured. The modern wire we supply is made in Worsley, near Manchester, and is known as thin wall wire. With advances in modern insulating materials, the thickness of cable insulation can be reduced for a given gauge of wire. This is great as it means looms can take up less space and can be more flexible. The advanced insulation also enables the wire to carry a higher current for a given size. For example, old school 1mm PVC wire was only rated for 8.75 amps, whereas the modern thin wall wire of the same size is rated at a whopping 16.5 amps. The important measurement of wire is the cross-sectional area of the conductors, and this is used to specify it. Automotive wire is made up of multiple strands of copper, giving the required flexibility to cope with vibration. The cross-sectional area of each strand is calculated and multiplied by the number of strands in the wire. For example, 1mm thin wall wire has 32 strands of 0.2mm diameter copper. To calculate the cross-sectional area of the individual strand, one uses the formula pi r squared. So, a diameter of 0.2 is a radius of 0.1 millimeter squared is 0.01 multiplied by pi, approximately 3.14159, if you then multiply that by the number of strands, you get 1, as in 1 millimetre squared. That's the O-level maths bit done to show how the wire is measured accurately. We have discovered that sufficient numbers of people we have talked to are under the misapprehension that to measure wire, one uses a caliper around the insulation to make this explanation viable. This is very much not the case. If you strip back the insulation and give the strands a bit of a gentle twist and measure the copper, that will give you a better idea. The diameter of the copper on 1mm wire is roughly 1.2mm and 2mm will be around 1.7mm diameter. The vast majority of bikes made in the last 50 years will have 12 volt electrics and nearly all the wiring on the bikes will be fine with 1mm wire. The wiring from the alternator to the regulator rectifier and onto the battery and the fuses often use 2mm and the main feed to and from the ignition switch generally uses 2mm. 6 volt electrics are a different kettle of worms because for a fixed wattage the 6 volt system will draw double the current power 
measured in watts, equals voltage, measured in volts, multiplied by the current, measured in amps. For example, if you have a 24 watt bulb on a 12 volt system, it will draw 2 amps. But on a 6 volt system, it will draw 4 amps. The higher the current, the heavier the cable needs to be. If there is a 12 volt conversion for your 6 volt bike, I'd strongly recommend getting it bought and fit it. Battery and starter cables are also much thinner nowadays thanks to thin wall technology. Most bikes with an electric starter use a 10mm cable. The exception to this rule are large singles and big twins where they are likely to need the extra current so we use 16mm cable. Well that's it for the introduction. In the next video we will start fitting terminals.